Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright, a consultant audiologist and director of Clearwax. Thank you for joining me in my latest video where we have a patient who attended with bilateral otomycosis, which is the term given to a fungal infection that's present in the ear. And this patient suffers from seborrheic dermatitis and typically that's a chronic form of eczema, normally found um, on the body where you have sebaceous glands. So of course, we have sebaceous glands which secrete sebum um, in the ear. And it's normally triggered by a fungus called malassezia, um, which after some further research can be found in the ear. It's typically not. The normal fungi um, that's found in the ear is typically candida and uh, aspilogis, and you get different strains of aspilogis, like aspilogis niger or flavis, for example. And under normal conditions in the ear, um, uh, these fungi are absolutely uh, harmless. Um, so it forms part of the skin flora. So uh, on the surface of our skin, we've got an entire ecosystem of bacteria and fungi, and um, they live there harmlessly, um, it's a symbiotic relationship, really. Um, it, it, in regards to the ear, these fungi and bacteria seek shelter and food. Uh, and in return, the ear doesn't actually benefit uh, in return, if truth be told. But when the conditions of the ear change, for example, if the temperature rises or there's moisture, or the uh, pH level increases from uh, a mildly acidic to a more neutral or, nu uh, or alkaline, um, some of the resident bacteria are outcompeted by more pathogenic bacteria. Um, and also the fungi, which are normally, um, as I said, uh, non-pathogenic, they overgrow and it creates an immune response and then we, uh, they, they develop into an infection. And uh, this patient did mention they have seborrheic dermatitis, which is, as I said, a form of eczema and normally found on the scalp, um, um, kind of and it's sometimes referred to as dandruff as well, um, but they said it also affects their ears, and uh, with the ear, uh, the the fungi, as I said, that normally triggers this is malassezia, and uh, it's more common in cats and dogs. So, um, patient may have a, a a pet that they are uh, harboring uh, this particular back, uh, fungi from into the ear, but. With seborrheic uh, dermatitis, it's more of a, a genetic predisposition or environmental factors. And this patient did uh, inform me that they do get water in the ear. So uh, it's the first thing that we can try and um, try to omit uh, is to avoid water entering this patient's ear because that itself may, may, may resolve at least their uh, otomycosis in the ear. Now, you can see all this hyphae. Um, so the hyphae is like this woolly strands that are typical of aspilogis. In their right side, uh, they have uh, fungal spores and they're more of a green yellow. And that's more typical of a um, aspilogis flavus, which is a, another type of strain of aspilogis. But we've got this, I've cleaned it all out. I've stripped all this dead skin. So if you like a good skin peel, I'm going to actually use the right correct as well later in the procedure to almost strip the skin like um, wallpaper. Um, and that's where the Rycoet really came into its own. Not only is it able to remove kind of firmer pieces of wax, um, so it's quite a robust instrument, but its tapered tip allows me to get in between the canal wall and uh, the skin and uh, peel away this. So typically with a fungal infection, it tends to manifest deeper in the ear, it's a bit warmer, on the eardrum, it's just the perfect location. So this infected skin is really strongly adhered to the eardrum and I was having to apply a lot of pressure. And patients here, most of it is slightly narrower than the norm. So it's very little maneuvering available in, in the ear. So let's have a look. So the eardrum has still got a lot of debris on there. And I'm just going to start peeling away some of this dead skin. You can see the underlying skin is inflamed. And uh, with inflammation, uh, your ear produces more skin because you've got increased blood flow. The more skin your ear produces, eventually the more dead skin your ear is going to shed. And that's all collecting in this patient's ear. And, and that provides more uh, food, if you like, for the fungi and bacteria, which can then lead to an infection. 
so it's almost like a domino effect and as I said the first thing this patient can do is to um, avoid water in the ear now the patient was very honest they did admit to using a hairpin they said the ear was so itchy and you can just you can tell by examining this patient's ear how itchy it is and they're very upfront and honest and they said they may have caused trauma now there was a bit of um calcification a bit of what we call moringa sclerosis which is about calcification of the eardrum so you get calcium deposits in the middle layer of the eardrum the fibrous stratum layer and you can't see that at the moment because you've got this skin and with a fungal infection the skin is really really tricky to remove off the eardrum because it's slightly damp and i'm always trying to find a corner of the dead skin so i can start peeling away it's almost like if you're trying to remove some sticky tape off some paper or a label off uh, a bottle for example you're trying to find that corner point where you can get your fingernail underneath and start peeling and we're doing that in this patient's ear and of course the ear is sensitive so you've got to be very very careful whilst we're doing that um, but yeah posteriorly once I remove all that debris there is a bit of uh, moringa sclerosis now moringa sclerosis typically doesn't cause much of a hearing loss tympanous sclerosis is a different type of calcification um, that's when you get calcium deposits um, so think about it like scar tissue, but not only does it affect the eardrum, but it affects the ossicles, the three middle ear bones, and that can cause a conductive loss. And what we mean by conductive loss is that sound energy, sound waves, as they travel through the ear canal, um, when they reach the eardrum, they hit the eardrum and the eardrum should vibrate. And um, this acoustic energy is then transmitted via the three ossicles, the bones, in a pendulum motion. So that converts into mechanical en energy. But if you've got tympanosclerosis and scar tissue, not only of the eardrum, but the bones, it restricts the, the, the ossicles' mobility so it doesn't vibrate as much. You can see we're removing this directly off the eardrum and underneath that skin there, there was a bit of a white patch. So that's a bit of the scar tissue. So obviously this patient could hear significantly better post-procedure, uh, but they still felt the left ear uh, wasn't as uh, acute as they're right so this patient does need some uh, obviously antifungal solution and once the ear is cleaned up then hopefully their hearing is going to be uh, back to the norm so although we clear all this because of the inflammation that's going to affect the transmission of sound waves so sound waves remember have to uh, travel through the ear canal and uh, in waves and so they're going to hit the canal wall and when you've got inflammation like this, it's going to attenuate, it's going to reflect a lot of these sound waves back out of the ear and absorb a lot of the sound energy. So there's going to be less, less sound waves uh, being transmitted up against the eardrum. So I'm using the fine end suction probe to avoid clarinet. I think it did occur once or twice. I, I did pre, uh, when it did occur, I did come out of the ear and I just explained to the patient what that was. But this again is quite adherent, as you can see. Again, I'm looking for that kind of point where I can start peeling. So I'm just coming more to the entrance. Now, um, purposely, we're trying to clean the eardrum as much as possible initially because when we perform earwax removal, it's not a cosmetic procedure. It's a healthcare procedure. So the patient attended because primarily they couldn't hear from the ear. So I, I want to clear the eardrum because that's why they've come. And everything else is a bonus. But sometimes just to remove stuff off the eardrum or near to the eardrum, you do peel stuff further away and go towards the eardrum. In this case, it wasn't necessarily the case. So although I'm peeling all of this, it's not really affecting um, any anything off in the eardrum. There's a bit on the front part of the ear canal and the anterior canal wall. Well, when I started to remove that, it did go towards the eardrum and it didn't, it stopped, it halted at the eardrum. So everything off the eardrum, I really have had to kind of peel directly off. There's nothing I could leverage in advance to the eardrum so this is where I use the right correct you can see the angulation there's a curve here that mimics the canal wall and because the tip is tapered it's just perfect it really really um, glided through and it took me a while to gain the confidence to use the correct in this way, way because previously um, the correct or the Jobson horn I used it was so chubby it was not possible to do things like this so when things are possible it just takes a bit of time for um, to gain the comment you can see you can some of the skin is translucent you can actually see the correct um, through the skin it just tells you how thin a layer it is and how well the correct is able to kind of separate and underneath the canal looks a bit healthier so what i'm trying to do is just bring it into the midline and i'm going to use some forceps i think uh, there we are and we're just going to pinch 
to the skin. I'm coming away a bit slower because I, I don't want it to tear away. I want to get as much skin out as possible. So the more um, outer half of the ear canal is looking good. So I'm just going back to the eardrum again. Again, I'm just looking for that point to start peeling up away. So I was hoping that's going to, as I'm peeling this, it's going to go to the eardrum and start peeling some of the skin off the eardrum. You can see it just terminates at the eardrum. So I think I'm going to go to the back part of the ear canal now. Let's have a look. Oh, watch again to the floor. So some of this skin, because it's infected, it's a bit damp. This patient, as I said earlier as well, had been getting water in the ear, so that doesn't help. The skin, it overhydrates in the presence of water. And the skin, as it overhydrates, it then swells and bursts and breaks down. So for me, having a bit of wax left on the eardrum, um, and which is not possible to remove with suction, I know some people then revert to, to uh, irrigation. I would just prefer to leave that wax um, I think the risks of using water to remove a little bit of wax that hopefully would migrate naturally. I, th I would um, prefer taking th those odds really uh, because so water can always lead to an infection. Um, it's probably about 5% chance of it, but 5% is quite a lot. And that figure, it comes from a study. Um, I can't remember the name of the study, but it, it's not a number that I'm making up uh, top of my head. Uh, there's been some research there, so about 5% uh, are likely to develop an infection in the presence of water in the ear. Um, and particularly more so if you're elderly or immunocompromised um, or diabetic. So under these circumstances, you just have less blood flow to the ear or your immune system is weakened. So um, with water, it will change the conditions of the ear to, to which will make, mean that it's more likely for bacterial fungi to thrive and if you've got a weakened immune system less likely your body's able to fight that um, the the overgrowth of more pathogenic bacterial fungi um, similarly with, if you're diabetic you just don't have that blood flow to help uh, provide the ear with the kind of the white blood cells for example it needs um, in order that kind of nutrients oxygen that it needs to fight away the infection okay I'm just starting to peel away from the floor of the ear canal as you can see there is it quite quite narrow as we we go deep it wasn't the patient did ask if they've got um a bendy ear canal I would say no the ear canal is quite straight but slightly narrow but nothing that I wouldn't say that was the trigger for this in patient's infection. That's the reason why they ask. Is there anything about the ear anatomy that could cause this to occur? And it's not. It's just this. It's very likely that uh, seborrheic dermatitis is the underlying cause for this uh, chronic otomycosis in the ear. So we're working directly on the eardrum, and it's. So it's very tricky because with this type of skin, as mentioned, it's quite hard to peel away because it's quite mushy. It's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, you may notice every time I enter the ear, we get a bit of condensation. We get a bit of misting, fogging on the lens. So that, to me, tells me that this ear temperature is raised and the uh, moisture uh, condenses on the coldest part of the ear and... In this case, it would be the tip of the endoscope. Um, but as soon as I enter with the suction tip, that is the, then the coldest part that's in the ear. So all that humidity that's condensated on the tip of the endoscope is sucked up and it's it attracted to the suction instead. So it kind of demists itself. If I wasn't using suction, I was using manual instruments, just by keeping the endoscope in the ear for a few seconds, well, probably 10 to 20 seconds, it will automatically begin to demist because the tip of the endoscope um, you've got fiber optic um, fiber optics that are helping transmitting the light so it does radiate uh, some heat through the whole endoscope but at a very low level so it's not excessive heat where it's going to scold or burn the patient 
so we just got this residual about skin that is coating the center part of the eardrum from uh, in fact the hammer bone can't see the hammer bone so again i'm going to the top i'm just trying to look for the corner of the skin and then gently peeling down and people with chronic fungal infections got to be careful because it can, can cause thrombosis like a blood clot um, supplying blood to the eardrum so patients with chronic fungal infections can have a perforation in fact i had a case of that the other day i will try and upload that video um, shortly but because of this patient separate dermatitis uh, which is then leading to inflammation there's just a chronic high turnover of skin here and this skin is not migrating off the eardrum it's causing a thickening of the eardrum hyperplasia of keratin this is the tricky bit see so yeah there's a bit of debris here and there but you're not going to manage to remove every last speck of debris or skin will be there for, for years well not years but for an hour or so um and with all the increased risk of potentially perforating the eardrum now, our appointments are typically allocated for half an hour, whether it be for one or two ears. A typical earwax removal procedure um, for myself, uh, this is your bog standard uh, procedure, probably a couple of minutes max per ear. It could be a lot shorter than that even, but if it average it out to say two or three minutes per ear. But nonetheless, I always allocate half an hour because we've got to obviously get the patient uh, welcome the patient, introduce ourselves, make them feel comfortable, just ask a bit of a history, uh, explain the procedure, and then we perform the procedure and then got to ex uh, explain the, the outcome of the procedure, share the video. Um, in this case, the patient wanted the video, so we airdropped it to them. They had an iPhone, which is possible. I've got to clean down. I've got to write my clinical notes, and then I've got to prepare uh, for the next patient. So half an hour is not, the reason why we allocate half an hour, it's not purely procedural, it's kind of everything around it as well. Um, however, this uh, patient, when they attended it, ultimately it took me about 45 minutes to treat, and that was procedural, uh, pure procedural. And obviously I've got other patients waiting outside, but I, I, I tried to, to just to continue and obviously I give my apologies to the patient waiting. And uh, they, they always understand because... If it was them in that position, they would want me to continue uh, to remove, uh, perform the procedure without rushing. So uh, the patient that was waiting in the waiting room was very understanding. They're a regular patient. And in the past, I've had to spend more time with their ear. And on this occasion, the next patient was in and out within a few minutes. Well, uh, the procedure took a few minutes, but everything else, of course, uh, took a bit longer. And, but they, they acknowledged that they were very understanding because, as I said, I've, they've had complex procedures performed in the area by myself in the past so really happy with this just a bit of damp skin a thinness of layers we're just going to peel this away so what's moving forward what, what we've recommended so some antifungal uh, solution drops right into the patient's gp strict no on water um strict no on hairpins uh, but it is a vicious cycle of course if someone's got an itchy ear it's easier said than done me telling them not to scratch the ear but if it's unbearable itch so i've given them two options some acetic acid spray, which can help, uh, which will help reacidify the ear. But because it's fungal, um, the acidity doesn't really. Uh, fungi are less affected by the acidity; they're more affected by moisture, humidity, and temperature. It's the bacteria that affects more more by the pH level. So, the higher the pH in the ear, the more likely you're to get um, pathogenic bacteria. So, but nonetheless, the acetic acid spray here does kind of help to kind of calm the ear down, make it less itchy. I've also recommended some clear relief drops. It's available from our website, only in the UK though. And it contains glycerol, which is um, which homogenizes with water. So basically it, it tries to absorb water. Um, so if there's excess water in there, it helps to dry it out. But it also contains lidocaine, which is a topical anesthetic. So it has a numbing effect. So if you've got an itch, just by having a bit of lidocaine in your ear, hopefully will numb the ear enough. Um, so it's not itchy. So they're the kind of the tips that we've given and hoping it's going to help. So here you can actually see the fungal spores on the posterior superior aspect of the uh, auditory canal. And it's more on the pars, me, uh, pars media. So the ear canal, as we've always uh, defined it in thirds, and there's different ways you can define it in thirds. 
You can define it in terms of the composition of cartilage and bone. So the outer third contains cartilage, the inner two thirds is made up of bone. Also the angulation and orientation. So the outer third, you enter the ear, you're having to kind of go superior and posteriorly in the case of the right ear. So we call that the pars, um, we call that the pars uh, externa, the outer third. And the pars media, you're having to rotate uh, to the right um, and almost downwards. So that's the pars media. And then the pars interna is the last third. So that's when you've got kind of the narrowing of the eardrum. And it's a lot straighter. So that fungal spores, it's kind of on the midsection of the ear canal. So the pars media, and it's on the top left part of the ear canal, the back section. So it's called the posterior superior quadrant. Do you have the facial nerve running there? And that part of the um, of the ear canal. Uh, below that, the posterior inferior, so the bottom left, you have the, the vagus nerve, which is the branch, uh, sorry, the Arnold's nerve, which is the branch of the vagus nerve. So if you make contact with that, uh, you can elicit the, the, the cough or the gag reflex or the lacrimal reflex. So the lacrimal glands, which are your um, tear, kind of teared up glands on either corner of your eye, um, the facial nerve is uh, connected to that. So if you stimulate the facial nerve here, you can set off that uh, reflex. Bottom left of the ear canal, patients can get the gag or um, cough reflex. Uh, the front part of the ear canal, that's the auriculo um, temporal nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve, which is the branch of the trigeminal nerve. So. The nerve, the ear canal does host quite a few nerves. Um, so whenever, again, I'm not a fan of irrigation, but if you perform irrigation, you mainly aim the, the tip of the irrigator to the top left part of the, um, of the ear canal. So if you aim it at the bottom left part of the ear canal, it can, as I said, elicit um, the the vagus nerve, which you can make you cough or gag. Uh, you can also get the vasovagal response. So that's when your uh, heart uh, slows down. So the vas vasovagal response, it can be triggered just by thoughts So people who see needles, for example. Um, it can freak them out um, and it uh, lowers your, uh, actually lowers the heart, uh, your heart rate, uh, your blood vessels dilate, which basically means the combined effect of that, if your heart's beating, pumping less blood and your blood vessels are dilated, it reduces your blood pressure. Um, so it's less blood going to your brain, so you can get, f people can faint. Um, that's the vasovagal response. But they can also cough and, um, and kind of a gag, so it um, affects the throat. And because of the orientation of the eardrum, it's oblique. So the top left part of the eardrum is more towards the entrance of the ear canal than the bottom right part of the eardrum, in the case of the right ear. So when you flush water in the ear, the, the safest place is to angle it top left, so you're not stimulating the Arnold's nerve. And water will then trickle to the top part of the eardrum, slide down to the bottom right, and then come back out. So that's normally the angle. If you flush it to the front part of the of the eardrum, there's a chance that um, it can get trapped in the inferior anterior recess. And it's gonna be less able to flush away wax because it's going deep into the, to the ear canal because that part of the eardrum is more medial. So you'll probably get a little current flow there, a little vortex there and just coming back. So it's gonna be, the water will be less spread across the ear canal, but if you, aim it top left, the water will go towards the top part of the eardrum on the left hand side, trickle down the eardrum and then back um, from the floor of the, ear, of the ear canal to the entrance. So it has a bit of flow, a bit of um, the dynamics of the water, the water flowing is more efficient in that route compared to any other route. So we've just got some residual crusted skin here. You see we use the right correct. No, I think finished with that now, so 
or you know, we might still use it, we shall see. We can see all this skin, it's, um, as we're peeling it away, it's so dry and flaky underneath. And again, water can cause that. So water can wash, wash away the natural oils. The natural oils that sit on the surface of the skin protects the underlying skin, helps it to retain its internal moisture. But by getting water in, you're going to leach away these natural oils and sweats. The underlying skin is then exposed to the environment. Moisture within the skin cells rises to the surface and it evaporates. So, so these oils and sweats produced by the ear, they help to moisturize, lubricate the skin, and it provides an acid mantle, so it inhibits the growth of harmful bacteria. It's just a bit of skin here, so I'm just gonna peel this away. And once more, we're just using the fine end, so it's less noisy, it's more precision. So, um, I know the patient's gonna be watching this video today, um, I hope he's well and had a safe journey back uh, as he travelled from Birmingham. Um, take care, keep well and speak soon. Bye.